You are listening to Fanfare Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Lowcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to Making Tracks. I'm your co-host, Mark Newbold. I sat in on a Bad Batch Season 3 roundtable with a number of fellow Star Wars outlets to talk all things Clone Force 99 with Michelle Ang, the voice behind Omega, in the Bad Batch. So here's myself and a number of other Star Wars outlets talking to Michelle Ang on this special episode of Making Tracks. Our first one is going to be Tricia coming from Fangirls going broke. Omega has this incredible ability to hope for the best from people or situations. What do you think the audience can learn from her optimism? You know, that optimism can get you through the face of some really challenging times. Um, season three is a really, is a, is a big one for Omega. She suddenly is hit with the realization that her, that she might be the cause for uh, why the Bad Batch is constantly in peril and that weighs pretty heavy. <laughs> Um, so I think, yeah, that that this, no matter how bleak the circumstances, if you can find a way to to have hope, then uh, then that can sustain you through some dark times. Our next one is going to be Dan from Coffee with Kenobi. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Omega is an is a total beacon of joy and hope for so many of us, and I want to thank you for that. Now, when you think about her journey, especially in this season, what do you think the most important thing for her to learn has been as her character in the series has progressed? It's kind of, oh, it's tricky, lots of things. But like for this season, I would say sort of self-confidence. Season two was so much about like learning skills from all of the different brothers. But now there's a big chunk of the season where she's literally alone or at least separated from most of most of the people she's relied on in the past. So it's this self-reliance that brings about a self-confidence that kind of sees her through the season. Thank you, Dan. Our next one is Mark coming from Fanta Treks. Hello. Omega's grown a lot, but how has she changed for you in the time that you've played her? And you know what? The, the writers have done a beautiful job of keeping the growth, at, you know, consistent. Um, so really, for me, my job's so easy because these scripts come fully formed and and because we are shooting them chronologically, which sometimes doesn't happen when you're doing live action, uh, I'm building off of the last episode that I've dropped anyway. So my knowledge is up to date with Omegas and I just rely on the, yeah, the sort of detail in the script. This is Steve Bloom, voice of Zebralios, and you're listening to Fanta Tracks. Caravast. <laughs> May the force be with you. Thank you, Mark. Our next one is Keith and Kerwin. Hi there. Hi, this is Keith and Kerwin from Father Sun Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys. Nice to see you again. Good nice to see, see you again, too. So, the series has allowed Omega to develop relationships with all of her brothers. What has she learned from each one? From each one? Um, I mean, I feel like, you know, primarily it was with Hunter and then, you know, then in season two, there was a, we got to explore a lot with tech, RIP, uh, and Echo and sort of, you know, the, the practical side of like having knowledge and, and fixing things and then Echo sort of the principled nature of knowing what his mission is in terms of which Omega has adopted as well which is like there are our brothers who need us who are being taken away and tested on and in peril and it's our duty to 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 you know and we should be in service of trying to help them um and then this last season is you know I'm so excited that Omega is reunited with Crosshair because she challenges him and in some ways I think Crosshair has something to learn from her (laughs) in this season um and their roles are reversed in some ways Omega becomes a caretaker and someone with wisdom 
both to cross here as an individual with what he's going through with his sort of trauma and PTSD and also the reintegration of like um, relationships after a fracture, you know, bringing crosshair back in and, and what forgiveness uh, and, and real love in the face of, you know, in the face of a betrayal and then reuniting together what that can look like. Thank you, guys. Our next one is William from Iron Cannon. Uh, actually, playing off of that last question, Omega has such a great relationship with each member of the Bad Batch. Uh, and the dynamic with each one is so different. Which is your favorite member of the Bad Batch to play off of? I feel like across the seasons it's changed because, you know, there has been stronger relationships. But e this is an easy question to answer for me at this juncture because season three, it's it's just so delicious, this new dynamic between Crosshair and Omega. And, uh, you know, because Crosshair is getting as good as he gives, you know, there are some juicy moments where she really gets to be like, listen, guy. <laughs> The, stop stop being stop being like this you this is how you do it and she gets to prove crosshair wrong and there's a sort of like beautiful funny bickering that underneath it all has so much love which is at least in my experience so indicative of what family actually is like the ability to confront and hold accountable and tease and still have it come from a place of of generosity and ultimately love Thank you so much, William. Uh, Sarah and Richard, are you guys are next. Hey, hey, this is Sarah and Richard from Skywalking Through Neverland. It, it is. Hey there. It's so much fun watching scenes between Omega and Batcher. Do you get to record <laughs> scenes with Dee Bradley Baker as he's performing Batcher? And how much fun is that? I mean, this is wild and obviously well known at this point. Uh, Dee is just such a vocal magician and he absolutely leapt at the chance to play Batcha. And, you know, with Dee, there's never any, I would be reading the script and there, there are moments where it calls for Batcha to be expressive and it would just be this like long sort of diatribe of moment. And I'd be like, is that, nope, nope, let's go. Okay, well, it's, it's D just bring so much color to it, which was really essential being that you're right. Omega has this deep connection to a non-speaking character. Um, but yeah, watching D utilize that amazing skill of his is never, ever gonna bore me. It's just incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much. Alex, you are next from Star Wars. Hi, this is Alex from Star Wars Explained. Uh, hey. One of my favorite, hi, one of my favorite Omega character traits is how she will mimic the mannerisms of the people that she <laughs> looks up to, like Hunter or Fee. Uh, if you could pick any Star Wars character for her to, for her to hang out with and mimic, who would you like to see? Mm. Mm. Any Star Wars character? Well, I mean so tricky I don't know all I can say is I don't know if you guys have seen up to this part but like Asajj Ventress was a real it was incredibly interesting to Omega like like you know she's come across formidable uh female figures but uh I think that one in particular really sort of took Omega yeah it took Omega she had to take a step back and sort of there was this sort of fear and respect and like intrigue so maybe her for everything in one location daily news reviews interviews podcasts video and social media feeds bookmark fathatracks.com for star wars news 24 7 365 yeah! our next one is george um over the course of three seasons omega has kind of won everyone's Parts over to some beautiful moments, some intimate ones, some epic ones. I'm wondering if there's a particular Omega moment or even episode that really stands out to you across your three seasons of work. Mm, oh my gosh, that stands out to me. It spans so much, so so much time, and my memory is so bad. But uh, like, I guess, I mean, I know you guys haven't seen the finale of season three yet, and there were slightly different ways we you know we weren't set on exactly how it was going to end so there were sort of some explorations um but like as a as a actor and as like an emotional sort of moment I'd have to say that I know that's such a mean answer because you haven't seen it but just 
I feel like it was it's like the culmination of my journey as a performer and Omega's journey as a character, like all consolidated into like two lines <laughs> or something, you know? Yeah. Thank you, George. Our next one is Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin from Sky Talkers. So nice to talk to you today, Michelle. Um, my Caitlin. question is, Last season, we saw Omega witness the Senate hearings where they discussed the future of the clones. And now she's seeing what's happening to them at Mount Tantus. How do you think experiences like these are changing Omega as she's growing up and her understanding of the galaxy? Well, you know, the, the whole concept to her that there is there are differences between rights of living beings just blew her mind. You know, like some people have rights, some people have, have, you know, the ability to be represented. And then there's this whole community of who she considers her brothers and now sister who, who don't. And so that inequity, I think at first was like sort of mind blowing, but you're at Mount Tantus. It's really dark. Like these, the, the things that are going on there are, very without even having that knowledge of of politics or whatever just on a on a hum, humane level she's like this is deeply unsettling um so sorry what the, what was the part the second part of your question <laughs> oh just how it's influencing her and her thoughts on the galaxy and growing up yeah I mean I think this is where the complexity of like the fact that she's still a child, but then knowing that things are wrong sort of come into play. Like, I don't think she's worried about fixing the whole galaxy, but what she does feel very strongly about is this facility is, is doing things to people that, that, that I care about and we need to get them all out. So that becomes like a very, very forceful drive throughout season three, which is that not only does she want to extricate both herself and crosshair, but there's this desire to, that is not accomplished until she's managed to take out all the clones from Mount Tantus. Thank you, Caitlin. Our next one is Tara. Hi, Michelle. This is Tara Bennett from Star Wars Insider Magazine. Um, I wanted to circle back to the question before last, just in terms of talking about the end of the season. Um, it's really special, you know, that uh, you got a chance to complete the arc of, of your character in the series. And, um, uh, without spoilers, but just in terms of your own of your own experience with it, did you treat that final um, script in a different way? Was it? Um, did you want to know what was coming? Um, what, did you want to be go pure when you went, when you went into it? I know you said that there were still some changes, but you know, at the end of the day, it's the last time um, maybe you know that you'll play her. Um, so it's just interesting to see how you you kind of treated it, and then you know if it, you wanted to be surprised as you read it. I mean, I knew it was obviously we knew this was the, going to be the final um, season and it was with great trepidation when I received the last script that I opened it up. And, you know, I will admit I, it wasn't like I was reading it while I was eating lunch. Like I had to prepare myself emotionally before opening up the document because, yeah, it is it's it is really sentimental. And and I was I was sad, uh, you know, I'm grateful for the journey, but the fact that it had to end after three was, you know, was surprising and, and shocking, but also I think that the writers have done a beautiful job. I I don't know how to say it with it's so hard to say it without giving spoilers. I think that the the gravity of the final sort of moments <clears throat> made it easy to feel like that was the culmination of everything. Like the I was excited um, in one in one sort of exploration because uh, Omega was sort of set up uh, with the possibility of a very large future, perhaps, and then um, and then it changed from there. So then I had to park that um, expectation about where Omega would end up to one side and go with the new idea, um, which was a little bit bittersweet. Uh, but I, I also was able to see some of the previs uh, because the because the last two episodes took a little bit longer to put together, and that was actually really awesome to see the visualization of those final moments, and that yeah, yeah that sort of brought the whole experience together for me. Thank you, Tara. We have one more question for Sarah and Richard. 
Okay, great. Uh, so basically, Omega is in the first part of the season, you know, she's captive. And before that, she was free with the Bad Batch. Is there anything you did different with like your prep or your voice acting to display those differences? That's actually really insightful as a question because there was this talk about like how long has she been in this facility? And, you know, we've all talked about her optimism in the face of, you know, terrible things. But even like the, I wanted to make sure it felt real that she was a, a prisoner, you know, and so that kind of the dreariness, the mundaneness, and, you know, she's kept in the cell with like no nothing stimulating and it's, she, you know, her closest person that she gets to, converse with is Emery who although she's her sister is like so cold and emotionally withholding um so yeah in terms of performance it's like having a physical toll of mundaneness uh adds a bit of like weight or it does it does change your vocal quality and, and I did think a lot about that um and sometimes, you know, the tension between wanting to re remain optimistic, but like then physically sort of feeling the burden of, you know, being kept or, you know, being in a sterile environment. Um, and I think that that was quite important. Um, I'm glad that you touched on it because it's a pretty, it's a pretty dark space for a young child to be living in. Hi, this is John Morton from The Empire Strikes Back, and you're listening to Fantha Tracks. Thank you, guys. We have one more for Alex. Uh, the Kiner's music is always a great highlight of any Star Wars animated series. So how does it feel to have your own musical theme? Is it your ringtone, or do you ever listen to it to get through the day? The, you, the Bad Batch theme song, you mean? Uh, or Omega's motif, but either. Um, I'm like, what's Omega's motif? Do I Omega's motif? Is there a motif for her that always comes out when she appears? I haven't clued on to that. <laughs> Not every time, but uh, there's definitely some recognizable notes. Ah, I mean, listen, I think the composers of the Bad Batch just are like the secret weapon because I don't get to see that. I get to obviously be there for the vocal performance. And then when I do pickups, I get to see some of the visuals. Um, some of them are fairly early in the stages, but I only get to, to like hear the composition once I view with the public when the series goes live. Um, so it always blows my mind how much extra emotional heft. I was like, wow, these composers are making me look good. <laughs> like, um, but I, for me, that um, the, I don't know the proper word, but the sound of like when the Bad Batch logo comes out is just, yeah, I have such strong emotional correlation of like feeling absolute gratefulness um, when I hear that because I still can't believe I get to be a part of your family. If you want to be part of the action, visit fanthatracks.com or be sure to comment, like and share on our social media feeds at fanthatracks. Send in your listeners questions by emailing radio at fanthatracks.com. Subscribe, leave a review, preferably if I so on, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Fanthatracks intro, Adam O'Brien for our making tracks opening music, and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers. Tune in to Good Morning Tattooing. It's live Sunday evenings, 9 o'clock UK, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. And check out our Fanthatracks radio Friday night rotation every Friday at 7 o'clock UK time for new episodes of The Phantom Down Under, Planet Layer, Desert Planet Discs, Start Your Engines, Collecting Tracks, Cannon Fodder, and special episodes of Making Tracks, and every Tuesday at 7 o'clock UK time for your weekly episode of Making Tracks. And remember, Phantatracks.com, our social media feeds, Phantatracks TV and Phantatracks Radio are absolutely... <laughs> So no Patreon, buy me a coffee, Kickstarter or Indiegogo required to stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news. Until we catch up with you again, may the Force be with you. Coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio, it's Planet Leia.